Uh, good morning. Uh, and we're almost to Scotland. I'm, I'm really, really excited. I, I, I love Scotland, and I love the fact that we're going to be able to have a few different days in different ports. Uh, it's going to be great. I, I did get a weather report from someone who walked on the deck and then very quickly said, I'm going to go to the lecture instead. Um, so I hear it's, it's a little chilly outside, so be sure when you get off the boat um, to be able to bundle up in multiple layers, because as we get inland, it may very well warm up. If you stay in town, it will probably be a, a little bit chilly, uh, but at least it's not wet, so that's going to be great. Uh, and today I am going to talk about a tapestry, and at one point I actually thought I knew how to say this word, and, and I was talking to someone who was a French linguist on board, and, and now I'm worse at it. So, uh, but I, I think the best way I'm going to pronounce it is by you. Uh, and it's not. It's by Joanne's back in the back, and I know she's take, taking notes. Uh, by you, and and so it's not bay, but by, and then you. And as she tried to explain it to me, if we think of uh, the sound of music, and they're all leaving, and they say, and you, and you, and you. So by you, everybody try it. Okay, the you did better than me. That's all right. Um, so we're going to talk, talk about this tapestry that is really, really cool. And this morning you may have woke, woken up and said, why are we doing 45 minutes on one tapestry? And it's because first and foremost, it's not a tapestry, it's an embroidery. So right there, that's something new you can take home to folks. But it, it is an embroidery and it's vitally important uh, to the Viking heritage in that this Battle of Hastings, which the tapestry talks about, or at least shows us pictures of, is um, the end of the Viking era. It is that time where after, the, after this, there really aren't a Viking heritage or culture that is being put forth, but a national heritage and culture that is being moved forward. So the Vikings have assimilated fully, or almost fully, after this tapestry. And so we're going to talk about why it's important to the Vikings. We're going to talk about why it is important to the Viking ship you're on. Uh, and there are some really cool aspects of this that have been incorporated. Uh, but we have two preliminary things to talk about. Uh, in this talk, I talk about the history of the tapestry and various pieces and parts, but I don't give a beginning to end kind of story of what the tapestry tells us. Uh, but the stairwells on the Viking ship have excerpts from this entire tapestry. Uh, and so I asked guest services uh, and Heather if we could put together some tours. Uh, and so we're going to add a couple of tours tomorrow night. And if you want to go on a semi-private tour of the tapestry, it takes about an hour. We'll do one at 5 o'clock and one at 6.15. But you have to sign up at guest services because I can only do 12, 14, maybe 16 at the tops um, at a time as we go through. So if you want to have kind of a guided tour with some extra stories, stop by guest services and sign up for that. It will be in the program for tomorrow, but for you guys, uh, you can get a kind of an advance on it if you wish. The other preliminary thing I want to talk about is something that's a little unique to me. Um, I, I like experiential history. I, I taught Egypt, e Egyptology for a long time. I did J-term classes uh, in Egypt, and I always feel that if you take a topic and you then experience it, uh, it creates a much more lasting and meaningful memory. So I try to pick something as a resident historian challenge where people can go out and try to find something. Uh, and we're going to Orkney Island uh, very, very soon. And so for this cruise's resident historian challenge, I want anyone who is willing to try to find it to find Brodgar. And most of our tours are going to stop there. And the winner of the challenge, because I know Viking people are very type A. So this is, this is a competition to an extent. Uh, the first person or group 
who can take a selfie with Brodgar will win the Viking Resident Historian Challenge. The, the next part of the competition is who can come up with the most original or creative selfie of you and your group with these standing stones. Uh, if you want to take, take a picture of this slide, then it would have uh, the ways to submit your picture. You can either email it to me at Babcock at yahoo.com, or you can WhatsApp signal or text it to me at that phone number. And then I will do something that only 12 people in the world will care about. I have a blog uh, that is followed by 12 really, really strong family members, uh, and it's called Renaissance Life dot world uh, and I usually post a little history of whatever site I pick with some of the pictures in it so if you want to take part in this feel free and we'll talk about it again in a later lecture but back on task uh, if we're talking about the Bayou Tapestry uh, it is really a story of multiple kings all of whom um, are Viking descendants so it's a Viking against Viking against Viking story. Uh, and so we're going to talk about the importance of the tapestry to history. It also, so often, we think of propaganda as being something that the modern news stations do. When you look at this tapestry, it is an excellent piece of propaganda. It is written by the winner. It is written by the winner to try to support why he is the rightful and just winner of this battle and the kingdom of England. And so the history of it is important, not just because it tells us about the Battle of Hastings, but because it shows us what political propaganda looks like. It tells us what average human life looked like. We, we get a lot of written narratives that tell us about kings and dukes and those types, but we don't often get, at least not in this 11th century period, depictions of what peasant life looked like. And so we get that in this tapestry. We find out about Europe before 10666, and 1066 is the Battle of Hastings. We also learn a little bit about foreshadowing, what happens after 1066 and the Norman invasion. Oh, and then Vic I'm going to do a shameless plug again for a little bit of the Viking heritage that we have here on the boat. So as we look at it, what is the Bayou Tapestry? First, well, who's been there? You guys were thinking. Okay, so a few folks. Um, it is roughly 231 feet long. So it is a really long tapestry. Think of an Olympic swimming pool. And we're one and a half times the length of an Olympic swimming pool. I mean, it is really long, and yet it's only about 20 inches high. So it's less than two feet tall by 231 feet long. And it tells us from the very beginning of the story of the Battle of Hastings what leads up to it, all the way until the coronation of the king, which is sadly lost to history. So it's a historical chronicle. It's a story of the 11th century, and it is an artistic masterpiece. It was done by the nuns of Canterbury, uh, so they put it together. It is housed at the cathedral at Bayeux, uh, which is in France, and so it was likely created by a guy named Odo, who was the head of that church and the half-brother of the winner of the Battle of Hastings, William. It's the story of kings. Uh, and at first, on the left, you see this guy who is Edward the Confessor. Now, Edward was known as being affable and tall and wise, and he rules for 24 years. So he, he is a king in England who comes from Viking heritage. So he is one of, of the Danish Viking families, the Anglo-Saxons, that came across and settled in England. Uh, and a guy named Canute, who was another Viking from Norway, 
had actually been ruling England. And Edward defeats him and brings it back to the Anglo-Saxon group who become the kings. And he is thought to be an incredible ruler. He is kind. He is thoughtful. He rules predominantly in peace. And yet he has one flaw. And that one flaw is he could not for the life of him produce a son. So he is getting older in life, and yet as he's getting older, he's realizing that he does not have an heir, and there is going to be a crisis of leadership for who is going to be the next leader of England. And he sits down, and he looks at all the possibilities. The most close relative is, is really a guy who is a guy named Edgar, and, and he, is, he is just not fit to be king. He doesn't have any military lead, leadership. He's not a thoughtful guy, and Edward agrees that he is not the right answer. Well, another possibility is his brother-in-law. Well, and, and his brother-in-law, Harold Godwinson, is a very wealthy guy, a very thoughtful guy, has some good leadership skills, but after pondering it, Edward says, you know, I think that William the Bastard, this, this guy over in France in Normandy, who is, he is a relation, but he's not as close. Uh, he has a funny name, but you know, he, William the Bastard, I think he's the guy who I want to succeed me. And he brings in, and in this picture over here on the left, uh, you see that, and I'm, I, you know, they, they say insanity is trying the same thing over and over again and hoping for a different outcome. I keep trying to make this thing work to where it's going to, there, see, if you just stay with, sometimes, it, oh, all right. So in that far left, you see the king sitting on his, his uh, throne, and he has his fingers pointing. The first thing to know about the Bayou Tapestry, anytime someone is pointing a finger, it means they're talking. Anytime their hand is like this or like this, they're listening but not talking. So you can see that the guy with the mustache over there on the left in kind of the goldish burnt orange looking tunic has his finger pointing. The king is leaning forward, looking somewhat happy, and is having a conversation with his brother-in-law, Harold Godwinson. And he is saying to Harold, I like you. You're a wonderful guy. I want you to be my emissary. And I want you to go across the channel over to Normandy, meet with William, and tell him that I want him to succeed me as the next king. And so they're having this conversation, and Harold says, I will go do as you ask. So that's what's happening in the very first scene, and it introduces us into Harold uh, the Confessor. Well, through a twist of intrigue, William doesn't become king. That when Edward dies, at the last minute, he changes his mind and says, I want you, Harold, to be the next king. So it's a story of King Harold. Harold becomes king, and you see him now sitting on the throne. He's got that orb that we saw. He's got the uh, scepter. He's got the crown. Uh, and we'll talk a little bit about the intrigue and the political as to how and why that happened. But it's a story of, of him as king. And then finally, it's a story of William the Bastard. Well, if you've been promised the kingdom of England, and all of a sudden this guy stabs you in the back and says he's going to be king, well, now you really want to be king. And so he amasses an army, and we have the Battle of Hastings, and ultimately William the Bastard wins the battle. Biggest thing that happens when you win the battle? One, you get to write the history. But two, you get to change your name from William the Bastard to William the Conqueror. And so he becomes William the Conqueror. So it's a story of these three guys and how it all gets put together. It's also this story of a broken oath. So Harold comes across, as he's told by the king, and he meets with William. 
and they have a wonderful adventure together. About 20% of the tapestry shows pictures of William and Harold getting along and going across the French countryside, terrorizing and pillaging and burning villages and doing the things that lords do. And, and, and they, they finally they get together, and Harold Godwinson, on the tapestry, if you look closely, he's got that sign of the Pope where it's kind of the peace sign with the thumb sticking out, and he is standing in front of sacred objects swearing an oath to William saying, A, I will support you fully if you desire to be king, and B, the king has sent me here to tell you that you will be that next king. So Harold is here um, using sacred objects like swearing on a Bible, saying, I will support you, and that he, yet he breaks the oath. Uh, and anyone speak Latin? I know somebody does out there, but uh, it, it, across the top, it not only across, on this tapestry does it give us pictures. And by the way, like 95% of all people in Normandy were illiterate, so pictures were the best way to convey a story. But it does have Latin written across the top, and it says, Ubi, which means here, herald sacramentum fake it. Fake it, he makes a sacred oath. And it's the dative of William, so to William, Dukey the Duke. So here it says he is making a sacred oath to William. It's also a battle chronicle. Uh, it is a story of how the Battle of Hastings is put together. It, it's, it's who fought who, where did they fight, kind of, of what type of infantry, archers, uh, and cavalry were being used. And it's done in the most beautiful way. We have eight different colors that are used in the tapestry. Uh, so eight different colors of thread. There are four different stitches. One of them becomes so famous, it's known as the Bayou Stitch, uh, or the Bayou Stitch, uh, and, and they use it back and forth. Uh, I, I do have a, a bit of a question. A bunch of nuns did this, right? So if you look at the top, there are naked guys. So which nun got to stitch the naked guys? I, I, I don't know, but uh, it also has a tremendous amount. Uh, the, the main stories in, in the middle but you have this upper and lower registry across the tapestry. And scholars have argued for years over what are they trying to convey. Uh, and the naked guys, I, I, at least I think they're trying to convey that you had to be fit and you had to practice. And these are two guys trying to practice war. Um, but the animals, as you look at it, I think that most of those equate to the coat of arms of the knights or the clans, basically the families that took part in the Bayou Tapestry. And because this is such a political propagandistic um, piece of art, I think most of that is so after the Battle of Hastings, families could come into the church at Bayou and point up and say, my ancestor was part, or my family was part of this battle. So I think most of these are family uh, crests that are being incorporated above and below. There are a couple of places that we know that's not right, and I'll bring up one of them, but it's an ongoing discussion among scholars today. But it does tell us a lot about how chainmail was worn, how helmets were worn, what they looked like, during this period, we don't have a lot of writing. So this is one of the archaeological pieces that tells us really contemporaneously, because this was started right after the battle. Uh, so we get a good feel for what people at the time thought that they were wearing and doing for shields. It's also a tale of victor and vanquished. And there's more than one victor. And there's more than one vanquished. So there are, are different people who are clearly winners. There are different people who are clearly losers. Uh, on the left, we have Bishop Odo, who is rallying the troops. And you know he's Bishop Odo because he is wearing or using a club and not a sword. 
And if you were a leader, so if you were a duke or if you were a member of the clergy, instead of having a spear or arrows, you actually had to fight with a club. And so we know he's clergy because he's out there fighting with a club. He's also the half-brother of William, and it looks like he is the guy who created this tapestry for his church. Um, so he is likely the guy who put it together uh, as an image. It's also about Harold who dies in the battle. And we'll talk about that a little bit later. But as a piece of propaganda, some English sources say that Harold died in the battle by being struck by a sword and killed. But there are other predominantly Norman accounts of the battle that say that Harold was struck in the eye with an arrow. And just off the left, in fact, I'm going to try it one more time. Let me go over here. Oops. Is it there? And I'm all, come on now. We should have a competition. Can Brian actually work this wand? Now, there's a, this guy right here. I got a, that guy. If you look up to the top very closely, well, okay, if you look up there, he actually has an arrow sticking in his eye. So both accounts are recorded in the tapestry where we have the arrow in the eye and we have a guy being struck down. And which one is Harold is something that people have been writing about for a hundred years. Uh, and so much so that if you look at the name Harold, you can see the O-L-D, the name Harold is right on top of the guy who has the arrow coming out of his eye. Well, most often in the tapestry, whenever um, a name appears, the name is right over the individual. So as we, we, we look at it, Harold is over the guy with the arrow. The Norman accounts say he was struck in the eye. Who thinks that is a good answer for the guy is being Harold? Who would say this is Harold? Okay, a little over half. Who would say that the English account that he is struck down is Harold? A few less. All right, we got a lot of non-participants this morning. Um, okay, so somebody getting their PhD. And, and to get your PhD, you have to pick the most obscure fact in the world, write a 300-page book that your advisor cuts to 200 pages. I'm a little, 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 you know, upset about that. But um, so they cut it back to 200 pages, and you defend this little teeny fact. Well, someone wrote their PhD dissertation on the arrow. So they wrote it, and, and, and they came out, and they actually were able to take a little bit of the thread. They had it tested. The thread does not go to 1080, which was about when this was done. The thread is from the 1600s. So someone in the 1600s added the arrow. All right, so how many think that this is Harold? All right, we got a lot more. How many are still hanging over here? Okay, we got one. We got one diehard over there. Now let me tell you the twist in our story. Someone else, because as soon as you do a PhD on something, then somebody else says, dude, that is a great PhD topic. I'm going to argue against them and do my PhD. So someone came in and tested around the fabric and found out that, in fact, in 1080, there was damage to that piece of cloth and the person in the 1600s was likely restoring the arrow to its rightful position. See, propaganda, man. We can change minds. Uh, so as you look at it, it's a still an ongoing idea. But, but propagandistically, if someone was shot in the eye with an arrow, it meant they were untrustworthy. So from a propaganda perspective, by, being, by saying that he was struck in the eye with an arrow, he is also saying that Harold was not a good guy. He was unworthy to be king, and he was worthy to get killed. So there's, well, while you go, okay, Brian, you just spent four minutes on arrows. But 
it's important because it tells us a lot about culture. It tells us a lot uh, about how this story is being crafted. So it's a story of victor and vanquish. It's also a story of logistics. Um, we learn how boats are made. Uh, up until that time, they knew clinker-built boats. They, they had a couple of examples that we had found in bogs that date back to this time frame. But this one actually, except for the blue horse, which probably is not historically accurate, um, it, it shows us how boats are being constructed, how, how bark is being taken off of them, how this clinker-built idea of a boat is being fashioned together, and how they cross the sea. So there's lots of artistic representations that help us archaeologically. Um, it also shows us how different... Uh, meals are put together. We didn't know, just a little tidbit, if you were in a traveling army, we didn't know that shields were actually used to make tables. And as you look at the tapestry, it shows us how they're putting together shields as plates, and they're putting together shields as tables, uh, and how they're taking pieces of the boat to create the camp. And so it changed how we view history. And here it shows us Bishop Odo with that classic Pope symbol, blessing the food. It shows us how they're taking chickens and, and putting them on skewers. It shows us cooking pots. But across the bottom, in that panel where I had mentioned that we have the family crests, we also have a really curious thing pop up. In three different locations, we have a fox a crow, and some cheese. And it's like, well, okay, it's possible that there's a fox, it's possible that there's a crow as someone's family crest, but this is clearly an Aesop's fable. So why is it that they put an Aesop's fable tucked into the bottom? And, and for those uh, who aren't just Aesop's fable gurus, um, the, the story here to go with the picture is you have a crow, and that crow has a piece of cheese, but the fox wants the piece of cheese. And so the fox is going, how do I get this crow to give it up? Because if I just pounce on the crow, I woke somebody up, I think, but you know, if, 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 if I just try to get him, the crow's going to fly off and I'll get no cheese. So, so the fox, being very sly and very cunning, walks up to the crow and says, you know, I've been looking around, and, and, and I've seen a lot of birds. But maybe, just maybe, you are the most beautiful bird I have ever seen. I'm just saying. Uh, you know, as, as a fox, you may not trust me, but, but I, I've seen birds, and, and I think you are the most beautiful. But what, what, what would convince me the most is if you could sing. Because, you know, if you're that beautiful and you can sing, then I know you're the most beautiful bird. And the, and the bird kind of goes, well, why, yes, I am. And, and the bird starts to sing. And as the bird starts to sing, the cheese falls out of its mouth and the fox gets the cheese and runs off. So Aesop is trying to say, beware of those who flatter you because they might be out for something. And why is that in the tapestry? We know it's a political document. It's not in the story anywhere. It's down in the bottom, uh, and it's not even in sequential order. It's just got a couple of different snippets, and then this one part where the cheese is falling out. So you have to think one of two possible answers. First answer is we have the nuns of Canterbury, and maybe the nuns of Canterbury, who are English, are, who are being forced to create this tapestry, maybe they're saying to people, beware of these Norman invaders who are flattering you because they're going to come take your land. Or maybe it's Bishop Odo who told the nuns to put it in as a warning to William. Beware of the English who flatter you because they're going to want something in return. Uh, but it's really curious that we get this Aesop fable that is truly poignant uh, in the tapestry as well. 
Uh, it's a contemporary snapshot. It, it shows, and these, these are both herald, um, but it shows us what types of tunics they wore. It shows us what their hunting birds look like. Uh, it showed us, in fact, you can see a little boat here. Uh, any ideas of what that, that thing poking off the backside is? It's a steering board, exactly. And so if you've ever wondered why the left side of the ship is called port, and the right side of the ship is called starboard. Well, this is a good example. The steering board is on the right. And if you drink enough ale, after a while, steering board becomes starboard. And in Old English, the star or steering board was on the right. And so if you have the steering board on the right, do you want to dock on that side? No, because you're going to crush your steering board. So you, you put the port side on your left, and you have the steering board on the right. So we learn things like that. We learn colors of boats. We learn the way the front of these Norman Viking uh, boats are put together. We learn a little bit about hunting dogs. So we learn a lot about life from the tap tapestry. We also know that whoever put it together had expert knowledge because Harold Godwinson, after the king says go to Normandy, first he goes home and packs and he goes to Bosham, which is where he lives. Uh, and at Bosham, they have this beautiful church that still exists today, dating back to the 10th century. And we see a depiction of it with those columns and arch uh, in place in Bosham. So it shows us uh, um, several different churches as we run through. It's also a historical record. Right after Harold is crowned king, we have overhead Halley's Comet. And astronomers have been able to confirm that early in 1066, Halley's Comet did, in fact, go over the area. And it is recorded in the tapestry. You can see they're all pointing at it. You can also see that they're pointing at it, and their hand color is black. Anytime black or blue thread is used, it is to say they are nervous. So if the king's not feeling well, his face is in black or blue. If the people talking are nervous, their hands are in black or blue. Uh, and so as they're pointing up at the comet, they have black hands. They're very nervous. They're telling the king about Halley's Comet, and it is thought to be a really bad sign for Henry. Uh, it's also an exquisite piece of art. Um, there is beautiful stitch work. There's beautiful colors. The horses are amazing. And this is where if you look around you, if you look at the cushions, if you look at the floor, if you go into your cabin and you look at the color scheme of your cabin, it is all taken from this tapestry. So the eight different color palette of the tapestry is the eight primary colors we use on all Viking ships. So this tapestry actually rules your Viking ocean ship. Um, and in addition to that, um, the woods that were used on the boat are the wood colors we use in the ships today. So all of Viking ocean cruise is patterned after the Bayou, ta or the Bayou tapestry. So uh, if we look at Europe, um, we, we've talked a bit about this before when I talked about the Vikings. The Danish Vikings came to England. Um, we have the Norwegian Vikings that go on to Iceland, Greenland, and North America. We have the Swedish Vikings that are going uh, into Russia and into the Baltics and then uh, down into the Med Mediterranean. So as the Vikings expanded, they are expanding into Europe uh, and especially into England. And so the Anglo-Saxons are actually of Viking heritage. Uh, we again see this slide where by time frame, when is that happening? And then we have Normandy. And Normandy it really comes from a guy named Rollo. Rollo is a Viking that is coming down from Denmark, 
and he is continually harassing France. And he goes to Charles the Simple after several raids, and instead of saying, I'm going to burn it down, he says, just give me tribute and I'll go away. And Charles the Simple meets with him and says, we have to come to a better understanding that I am happy sharing France with you. You clearly have mighty warriors, but can't we come to an agreement to where your warriors actually work with me instead of against me? And the Vikings were looking to assimilate as well. We see not only were they marauders, but often they would intermarry, gain the customs of the local population, and become strong members of the community. So when Charles the Simple meets with him, he goes to Rollo, and they come to an agreement where Rollo will get this plot of land uh, in northern coastal France, and he will defend that land for France. So he will stop other Viking clans from coming and attacking. But he has this beautiful fertile land, uh, and all that Charles asks is you defend me and you become a Christian. And so on the left, we have the depiction of Rollo becoming, being baptized and becoming a Christian. Now, this again is propaganda. Uh, Propaganda is throughout the church and throughout history, doesn't matter what time period we talk about. If you look at it, just shout out an age. How old is Rollo here? 14. I would say a teenager. Any other thoughts? Okay, is he tall or small? Small. Rollo was 6'4". He was 28 years old, and if he sat on a horse, it was said he was so long that his feet touched the ground. And yet, when Charles creates a picture of it, he's this cute little boy uh, who's getting baptized. So propaganda-wise, they take this mighty, huge warrior and turn him into a boy when he becomes a Christian. Uh, and it's, so it's interesting how pro- propaganda works. But, but Rollo uh, becomes the Duke of Normandy. Uh, he becomes French over the course of generations, all the way until we get to William, who is one of his ancestors. So William has a strong Viking background, but has become very French in the way he works. Um, we also look at Nor- Normandy, or I'm sorry, Norway. Norway, home of the Vikings from our per- perspective, has this King Canute um, who ruled Denmark for a time, even ruled England for a time before Edward. Uh, and in one of his proclamations says that he is the king of all England, Denmark, and the Norwegians, and some of the Swedes uh, that he puts together. So he is a guy who is very, very powerful, and he is really kind of the end of the Vikings in this region in that he still has a strong Viking heritage, even though it's beginning to be thought of as Norway and not the land of the Vikings. So he plays into our story as well. So 1066 and beyond. This is a really fateful year because, as I mentioned Edward sends Harold Hadrada, uh, I'm sorry, Harold Godwinson, over to talk in Normandy to William. He comes back. He tells the king, I have done exactly as you've asked. I've gone over. William is ready to take over when you die. But the king says, you know, (laughs) I hate to tell you this, but while you were gone, your sister, my wife, talked me into the idea that you should be the next king and not William. And so right after that, Edward dies. And he comes up, and and so the very next day, Harold is crowned king. Now, if you think about the current Charles, Charles, his mom died months ago, and yet Charles was just invested as king in May. It takes months to plan a coronation, and yet they rushed it because they knew William had this claim. So just one day later, they go to Westminster Abbey, they crown Harold as king. So in January, 
and in January, we have the death of Edward and we have the coronation of Harold Godwinson as king. In September, Harold Hadrada, who is the leader now of Norway, who is a strong Viking, has Viking nobles, he comes and attacks to take England back for the Vikings. And then later in that month, William invades. So we have a lot going on, but to put it in Viking perspective, we have a Norwegian Viking king who is the last of the cultural Vikings who says, I'm going to be king. We have Harold, the king of England, who is an Anglo-Saxon. He comes from the Danes. Uh, he has a strong Viking heritage, and he is king of England. And we have William, and William is a Viking descendant, but someone who has really kind of converted over to being French. So when we look at September of 1066, we have the last remnants of three different Viking lines all going at each other in battle. And after this, the Vikings are pretty much done. There is no more Viking heritage. It's English heritage. It's Normandy heritage. And it's Norway, Norwegian heritage that takes over. So in this battle, we know that Harold loses. I think I foreshadowed that enough that William is going to win. But it's really not that simple. Uh, as we look at it, Harold's not an idiot. He's actually a really brilliant military mind. And he has been sitting down there at the bottom of England in Hastings waiting for William. He's got spies across the channel. He knows they're building an army. He knows they're coming across. And he's got his army sitting there, and he's ready in July. He's like, I don't know when you're coming, but, dude, I'm, I'm, I'm ready. And July, nothing happens. August nothing happens. And at that point, half of his army says, you know, we have to go harvest our crops. And so early in September, half of his army goes home and starts to bring in the crops because maybe William is going to wait till next year. It's the, 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 if you look at the channel, it starts to get really rocky in September. No one's going to want to come across and do that. So they're beginning to think maybe it's just not going to happen this year. Half of the army leaves. Uh, I think I have, yeah. So on September 25th, the Norwegians land in the north. And a messenger comes up and says, you know, uh, King Harold, I, I, I know you've been thinking William's coming across, but, but there are these Viking Norwegians that just landed about 600 ships, about 8,000 men up north, and they're claiming England is theirs. Sorry. Uh, what do you want to do about that? So he takes his entire army that's left. He does a forced march over 250 miles, up to 270 miles. He takes them from the south of England. He marches them to the north of England. He doesn't let them rest. He just plows in to these Norwegians. He massacres them. He has brilliant mind in the way he puts it together, where they have between two and 300 ships that sailed all of these Vikings across. They only have enough to fill 25 ships going home. In addition, uh, Harold Hadrada is killed, and all of the Viking nobles are killed, wiping out the Viking heritage nobility of Norway at the time. So just this huge military victory that he has. So he's marched his people, I mean, 25 miles a day for a full army, that's a lot. And to do that in 10 to 12 days with no rest, you throw them into battle, they're exhausted. And when he finishes and they're plundering, a guy comes up and says, you know, I, I'm, I'm, I'm really sorry to tell you this, but while we've been up here September 25th, uh, October 14th, William, William landed down south with his army. So now what do you do? You've got an army that is out of position, it's tired, and you've only got half your army because the rest of them went home. So a smart guy says, let's take a minute and think about this. He writes... To whom? Who does he write? If you're, if you're in serious trouble and you're out of position and you want, you, you've, you've got one text or one call, who do you call? 
The Pope. I like that one. Who else? You call your mom, man. So he writes his mother and says, what should I do? And his mom has brilliant advice. His mom says to him, very slowly, take your troops down, put a barricade around William. It's coming up on winter. He doesn't have any food. He's going to have to go home at some point. Don't engage him in battle. Just don't let him take enough land to feed himself for the winter, and he'll go home, and you can do this thing next year. And like every good son, he does nothing that his mother tells him. So he, he comes out, and he force marches his troops two weeks down to Hastings. He does take the high ground, but he plunges straight into battle instead of waiting. If he had listened to his mother, he may have been king for a really long time. Okay, I thought I had another graphic. But um, if you look at the Battle of Hastings, most battles at the time lasted about two hours. That after two hours of cavalry and infantry plowing into each other, someone is going to break through the line and you're going to have a rout. Well, Harold takes the high ground. He has more infantry uh, than William does. He makes infantry and cavalry come uphill, and he has a line like a phalanx where he has these pikes coming out the bottom, and for nine hours he holds out against William. He's winning the battle. But at one point there is a rumor that William is dead, and they think the battle's almost over. And they break the line and they charge down the hill. But as they're coming down the hill, William raises his helmet and says, I'm here, I'm not dead. They all form around him and they end up winning. And so there are so many ways that Harold might have won the battle, but in fact ends up losing. So because William wins, he is able to change England forever. The Anglo-Saxons are pushed to the west. All the nobility are relieved of their land and possessions. And they bring in Norman leadership, Norman lords, uh, to come take over. And the outlook of England is changed. They also bring in and build over 80 new forts and castles uh, in order to intimidate the English that, in fact, you are part of Normandy, that we are in charge. They create the Tower of London. They create the Durham Cathedral. And they start with a Ro Romanesque uh, style of architecture. It moves uh, into more of a Gothic style of ar architecture by the 12th century. And they create the Doomsday Book that we talked about last time. But Hitler becomes uh, intrigued with this. Uh, and he actually feels that if he has this artifact, that, that the power of being able to conquer England is going to be under his control. The New Yorker actually takes it and does a parody of it, showing the Normandy invasion uh, as a Bayou, tap or a Bayou tap tapestry as well. Um, there's been research done on how it fits and how we, we have that 15 feet we're missing. We'll talk about that for those who want to go on the tour. And as you know, on the second floor towards the restaurant, we have our Viking Museum that goes into this a great deal. Uh, I've gone over, so I'm going to stop here. You guys have a wonderful half day day at sea, and I'll see you in port. Thank you very much.